Kuala Lumpur, capital of Malaysia, home to the world's tallest twin skyscrapers, the Petronas Towers, supported by the world's deepest foundation, spanned by the world's highest sky bridge. Over a billion dollars worth of concrete, steel and glass went into their epic construction that took almost eight years. The Petronas Towers are not only marvels of engineering, they're uniquely Malaysian icons for the 21st century. Malaysia is a bustling melting pot of races and religions. 25 million Malays, Indians, Chinese and other ethnicities live side by side in a predominantly Islamic society. Economic development between the 1980s and 90s has also put the country on the fast track to becoming one of Southeast Asia's tiger economies. One major beneficiary of this prosperous time is Malaysia's capital city, Kuala Lumpur, the heart of the country's industry and commerce. During this period, the physical landscape of the city transformed. Numerous construction projects emerged, making Kuala Lumpur one of the most built-up capitals in the region. One of my abiding memories of Kuala Lumpur in the 1990s was just the number of cranes on the skyline. I've never seen a, a city, I think, uh, with so much construction going on. But despite the construction boom, the cityscape still didn't have a focal point, a single identifiable landmark that the world would come to know. Cities, city authorities, politicians everywhere are seeking to put their cities, put their nations on world maps. But it seems to me that perhaps there was a recognition in the 1990s that many people around the world didn't have a, a clear sense of, of where Malaysia was. The Malaysian government sought to rectify this and let the world know they were a true global player. They needed to build a first world icon grand enough to announce their arrival on the world stage. Taking cues from iconic skyscrapers in the West, the Malaysians decided they would also build a one-of-a-kind skyscraper. Or in this case, two of a kind. They named them the Petronas Towers. The firms were all told that this would be the headquarters of the national oil company, Petronas. This building is in Kuala Lumpur. It has to reflect the heritage of this country. It had to reflect the cultures. And, but very importantly, we said we wanted this building to look beautiful, to show progress. Alida Arif was one of the key administrators in charge of planning the towers. And, like many of her colleagues at the time, she saw the symbolic value in a skyscraper. It was very important of us for the symbolic reasons to show progress, to show aspirations of the country, that's aspirations for Malaysia to become an industrialized country. The design of the tower, in particular because of its heights, is sort of reaching for the sky image, seems to, to depict that aspiration. The Petronas Towers were supposed to stand out as an ultra-modern icon, but they still had to retain their Malaysian identity and incorporate many of the nation's most identifiable cultural motifs into their design. With this brief in mind, a competition was launched worldwide for top architectural firms to submit design ideas. The winning entry eventually comes from Cesar Pelli, the world-renowned Argentinian architect. I thought that the request that we connect the building with Malaysia was a very good request. And we explore quite thoroughly Malaysian traditions, Malaysian buildings, Malaysian craft to capture the essence of what Malaysian means in a building. 
Pelly took his inspiration from what he saw all around Kuala Lumpur. He reinterpreted the symmetrical patterns of classic Islamic architecture and integrated them into the design of the ultra-modern Twin Towers. As a result, bridging the gap between technology and tradition. A concept he used to further emphasize the tower's presence as a gateway. In the brief, we were requested to build two towers to form a gateway. Most of the other competitors did towers of varying sizes. But as I was trying to seek a symbolic quality in these towers, I quickly realized that having them in a pair symmetrically placed, the symbolic value of those towers strongly increased. With the design decided upon, the engineering team was given a deadline of only three years to complete the construction of the Petronas Towers. It was an ambitious timeline, and to achieve it, they'd have to build the towers faster than any skyscraper construction anywhere in the world. Even more challenging, the Malaysian builders had no prior experience constructing a super skyscraper. To top it off, one more challenge was thrown to the design and engineering teams. The question was actually asked by then the, the Prime Minister, um, uh, Tun Dr. Mahathir, what would make it the tallest building in the world? And, you know, Pelly thought about it and he said, you know, you probably add another 10 meters or so. And we were struck by the point that it's, that's, that's all that it would take to make it the tallest building. And yes, okay, so make it so. <laughs> Suddenly, the Malaysians were not only faced with building a mega skyscraper for the first time, they were also about to construct the world's tallest buildings. Today, Malaysia's capital, Kuala Lumpur, is identified by an iconic landmark, the Petronas Towers. People from all over come to see the world's tallest twin skyscrapers. But as much as the Petronas Towers stand out internationally, they're also able to blend into their Malaysian surroundings. This is the result of a strict brief given to Argentinian architect Cesar Pelli. Pelli's design adapts the geometric shapes of Islamic architecture found all around Kuala Lumpur and reinterprets classical Islamic patterns. That decorative elements of the towers, floor patterns, wall patterns, that incorporated not only Islamic traditions of the design, but many specifically Malaysian crafts and decorative elements. But those are now transformed into contemporary visions of what is a very old tradition. Even the shape of the building has its roots in Islamic design. Two interlocking squares form the eight-pointed star shape of the tower's floor plate, an important motif in Islamic art that symbolizes unity and strength. This interlocking of the squares have played very importantly in the form floor plate of the tower. Now it's based on a simple geometric form of a square okay, and interlocked with a second square and this forms the basic geometric form of Islamic geometry but the floor plate design has a fundamental problem its interlocking squares limit the usable floor space in the building a solution is quickly found we slowly changed it with by adding eight semicircular lobes into a 16th lobe star. This is now a very efficient floor plate. To explain this further, Caesar proposed that at the intersections of these squares, he proposed circulars, and that's how the floor plate got projected out, and we have a sharp edge, a rounded edge, a sharp corner, a rounded corner. <laughs> The 
The major design issues may have been resolved, but the bigger challenge remained. How do you build the tallest skyscrapers in the world? Back in the 1990s, the country's tallest building was a mere 60 stories. Constructing a skyscraper at a record-breaking 88 stories would be a tall order for Malaysia. There was a lack of experts with the depth of experience needed for a project of this scale. A multinational team was quickly assembled, the likes of which had never been seen in Malaysia before. And this was very much a multinational effort. We had the English, we had the Scots, we had the Americans, we had the Canadians, we had the Japanese, we had the Koreans, we had the Chinese. You know, almost every single country was represented in, in one form or another. So it wasn't just a local effort. The engineer's first task is to figure out what material to build the Petronas Towers with. Skyscrapers are usually built with steel. But steel is not only an expensive material, it's something Malaysia is short of and also unfamiliar with. Now, if these towers were constructed in, in America or in Japan, they definitely would have been steel structures. To build the towers this tall, using mostly steel, would have blown the budget sky high. The solution was to go with the one material the Malaysian construction industry had in abundance. Concrete. Chris Landry is a concrete supplier who knows very well what the challenges are with using this material. The Twin Towers took approximately 180,000 metres of concrete. The, that's a fair volume of concrete in any structure. Every metre of concrete uses approximately two tonne of material, and we were pouring, you know, 24 hours a day, so you can just imagine the volume of the material that was going through the actual site. Concrete, the world's most common construction material. A building made of it can resist strong winds and absorb twice as much vibration as that of steel. But concrete isn't as light as steel. Using it would make the Petronas Towers the heaviest structure on Malaysian soil. The combined weight of the towers reaches a staggering 600,000 metric tons, the equivalent of almost 4,000 jumbo jets. Needless to say, their tremendous weight also meant tremendous pressure on the ground beneath. We are talking about loads, mega loads. Here we have each tower's uh, loads which are close to about 300,000 metric tons. So under such loads, with such mega building, we would need a huge and a large foundation to carry this building. To cope with the crushing pressure generated by the weight of the tallest towers in the world, engineers realized they'd have to plan and build the world's deepest foundation. Kuala Lumpur sits in the Klang Valley, a flat alluvial land surrounded by limestone hills. But while the valley's floor appears to be a smooth and unchallenging landscape, What's underneath can be as erratic as the limestone outcrops that encircle it. Building the world's deepest foundation on such unpredictable ground would be easier said than done. Before building the massive foundation, the geotechnical profile of soil conditions at the site will have to be studied. This involves drilling over 400 exploratory boreholes into the earth. Stephen Tong was the structural engineer on the ground whose task was to examine the test results. To his dismay, his worst fears came true. The location sits on the edge of a cliff. Being a tower of this height, you know that the stresses underneath the soil are tremendous. And sitting on a cliff means that it causes tilt on the tower. The underground cliff that the towers are to sit on is limestone bedrock that starts shallow 
that slopes steeply downwards more than 180 meters. Normally, limestone is good soil and uh, it's rock. It provides a good end bearing for foundation. But in this case, the limestones have cavities in it and that pose a soil problem. Over time, the problematic limestone bedrock can result in unevenness and cause the towers to tilt dangerously. The engineers broaden their investigation around the site. They discover stable terrain 60 meters away from the original location. By moving the site to the new location, the towers avoid problematic bedrock and anchor firmly on stable soil. A massive concrete raft will now be constructed and laid across steel pilings drilled some 125 meters into the ground. The uh, foundation system of these buildings is actually a combination of pile raft foundation. Piling meaning deep columns penetrating into the soil and the raft capping all these columns. To prepare the ground for the foundation, an army of builders and digging machines are brought in to excavate the initial depth. Even a large underground stream is no match for these diggers. Powerful water pumps are used to turn the stream into a mere puddle. Pilings are driven firmly into the ground to form the skeleton of the foundation. To fill the 4.5 meter thick foundation skeleton, over 13,000 cubic meters of concrete is required. The same volume as five Olympic-sized swimming pools. The quick drying nature of concrete meant that any delay could ruin the entire pour. So the team sets a punishing pace, pouring an average of one truckload of concrete every single minute. The pouring goes like clockwork from day to night. Not even a strong tropical storm can stop the men from continuing their work. After one year of planning and building, the massive foundation was finally ready to support the heavy loads of the Petronas Towers. There's no time to waste. Engineers had just two years left to build the towers that would become the tallest skyscrapers in the world. There would be no room for mistakes. Among the most distinctive features of the Petronas Towers are the pinnacles. Twin spires that form the apex of Kuala Lumpur's famous landmark. They stand 452 meters above the Earth's surface, crowning the world's tallest twin towers. The idea of wanting to have the form of the building extend itself as much as you can into the sky, I think it's a basic human impulse. It's the desire, perhaps, of trying to connect our earthly beings with something higher in the sky. Today, the Petronas Towers provide an effortless view of the Kuala Lumpur landscape. But 10 years ago, taking the towers to their record-breaking height was not so easy. During the construction of the towers, building each floor of the 88-story skyscraper was back-breaking work with no margin for error. As the Petronas Towers began to take shape, engineers had to maintain the tower's verticality. This means keeping the building straight as it climbs to the top. A deviation of even millimeters can cause the skyscraper to lean. Building crews were also in the race against time. They had only two years to complete the construction of both towers. 
To meet this tight deadline, planning managers realized they had to build one floor of the Petronas Towers every four days. We were looking at a four-day cycle per floor, and that, that is very, very fast. Uh, even today, uh, that is still among the highest uh, rate of construction in any of the tall buildings anywhere around the world. To maintain the rapid four-day cycle without compromising the integrity of the structure, engineers decide to use concrete. Besides its strength, builders in Malaysia were more familiar with concrete and worked faster with it. But using ordinary concrete to construct tower columns 452 meters high would result in massive column sizes and affect the building's design. So high strength, more compact concrete was needed to streamline the columns. The problem was, this type of concrete had never been used in Malaysia before. Engineers brought in high strength concrete experts like Simon Jeffrey to push the concrete mix to unprecedented strength levels. Here's our uh, compression machine. This machine can compress up to 3,000 kilonewtons. When we're dealing with skyscrapers, we have zero margin for, for error. How we guard against it, our primary guard is we over-design our mix. For example, the grade 80 uh, that we supplied to the towers, the average strength achieved was 101 megapascals. That's 25% stronger than what the uh, engineers stipulated. The grade 80 high strength concrete is so strong, it's able to withstand the combined weight of 500 elephants for every square foot. The engineers were now not only able to build really fast, but also create a concrete monolith stronger than most skyscrapers. But the outer cosmetic beauty of a skyscraper is just as important as its inner strength. Besides trying to build the tallest skyscrapers in the world, the Malaysians wanted to build one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. But beautifying giant skyscrapers is no easy task. It would involve using over 80,000 square meters of steel to add another unique feature to the towers. These are the only two towers in the world which are cladded in stainless steel uh, completely. The stainless steel is a beautiful material in the sense it captures light in different ways at different times of the day. The shimmering beauty of the Petronas Towers today can be attributed to the efforts of hundreds of metal workers who clad her armor of stainless steel. In order to match the four day per floor cycle of tower building, they had to devise a special process that involved prefabricating a unique wall panel system. The man behind the metalworks company responsible for knocking these wall panels into shape is Mr. Cha T. In just two years, Cha T and his team would have had to cut and assemble a total of 33,000 panels, installing 120 of them into the towers each day. When we got the contract in 1993, we have a factory area of about 75,000 square feet. This is our commitment to the kind to expand our factory, to double it, so that we can cater all the manufacturing and assembling activities in one area. It was the largest amount of stainless steel that Cha T ever had to work with. He quickly realized that to cut the panels accurately in a given amount of time, he would need reinforcements. This is the V-cut machine from Japan. 
A power cutter that combines the sharpness of a samurai sword with Japanese precision technology. We need a weak cut machine to weak cut all the corner, all the bent corner, you know, so to give you a very sharp look. The steel claddings may owe their clean curves to the latest in Japanese technology, but the idea behind them stems from a more artistic source. They are a result of architect Cesar Pelli's plan to reflect the changing light of the Malaysian tropical climate in the tower's design. We wanted to capture some of the feeling of a tropical building, some of the sense of exuberance and the richer play of light and shadow, the kind of double light that you have in the rainforest. steel cladding and tower construction are running smoothly, engineers still face the challenge of ensuring the building remains as straight as an arrow while going up. The alignment of the buildings is checked every day to ensure it doesn't sway from the direction of its upward climb. Everything seems to go smoothly, but as the towers reach the 40th floor, the engineers are struck with their worst nightmare. One of the towers is discovered to be leaning a few millimeters off tangent, and no one understands why this is happening. This is a major cause for concern. Because to us, millimeters could translate, if you don't correct the millimeters, it could translate to centimeters and to meters. I was afraid. <laughs> we have a tilting tower in KL. <laughs> I was afraid of that. With the leaning tower now looking like a potential disaster, all work on the building stops until a solution can be found. As general manager, P. Krishnasamy was in charge of monitoring progress reports from surveyors and engineers. So I think with, at that time, you know, because we didn't understand it, you know, I think it became a bit of a scare for a lot of people, you know, because we'd never been there. We then went to people who had built it before at Sears in Chicago, and they kind of picked it up very fast to tell us, you know, this is what will happen and the reasons why that happened. The solution the Malaysians discovered was to generate a stronger opposing lean to cancel out the current leaning problem. During construction, we would overcorrect the building in the opposite direction. We will build it such that if it were to lean in one direction, when we overcorrect it, end of the day, it comes to the correct verticality. Ironically, to fix a crooked skyscraper, engineers have to make the building equally crooked, but in the opposite direction. Fortunately, uh, the deviation was small, and the correction required was minimum. Now that the tower's verticality is restored, engineers turn their attention to the next big challenge. Hoisting a 325 metric ton sky bridge to the 42nd floor of the Petronas Towers. It's a bold plan, made bolder by the fact that it's never been attempted on skyscrapers of this height. Standing 170 meters above street level and spanning the Petronas Towers is the highest sky bridge in the world. Today, the Sky Bridge is the centerpiece of the national landmark and one of the main reasons why the Petronas Towers are unique. The idea for the Sky Bridge started as, a, as an aesthetic, artistic intention with a symbolic meaning. Connecting them with a bridge made them more clearly into a portal a portal to the infinite, a portal to the sky. Besides serving a symbolic purpose, the Skybridge also has a functional role. 
It serves as a corridor connecting the two towers. To manage the flow of traffic, designers also made it a dual-level bridge. People can get from one building to the next at midway without having to travel down the length of the tallest towers in the world for the same purpose. Though the sky bridge brings with it form and functionality, incorporating it into the Petronas Towers did not come easy. Even at the design phase, the bridge proved to be a major challenge. The sky bridge design went through a number of stages of redesign. It, I think, went through five different stages of design. At the launch of the project, the sky bridge had a little bit of a spider web kind of a feel to it. The original design had a series of steel wires locking the bridge to the towers. This was based on the theory that they helped to create stability. But when structural engineers studied the design more closely, they discovered the theory was flawed. We were faced with a problem here on a technical point of view, uh, a movement. We know it is a fact that both towers will move differently. Now, when both towers move apart, we know that if you fix the bridge to the towers, there will be tearing forces. The original web-like design of the sky bridge had to be discarded. Designers and engineers then looked into other potential replacements before settling on a new plan. The solution was to float the bridge. It involved building an inverted V-shaped arch that supports the bridge in the center. Two end bearings accommodate any movements caused by the natural tendency of the towers to sway. In fact, the design is that at the center of this point, at each of these uh, bearings, the bridge is allowed to move three quarters of a meter in either direction of the center. That is what I meant by floating. It is not fixed. With the new design approved, engineers had Korean steel experts, Samsung Heavy Industries, prefabricate the sky bridge and ship it over to Malaysia. It was important to make sure that every single element of the sky bridge had to be perfect. A convoy of large trailer trucks transport over 400 bridge parts through Kuala Lumpur. But this is nothing when compared to the bigger challenge that awaits them on site. Raising the main parts of the sky bridge to more than 100 meters above ground and then assembling them in mid-air. Since it's going to be constructed in the mid-air, we can't afford to make any mistakes. If you have any slight mistakes, it's, it's, uh, you, have to, you, can't, you can't do anything with it, you know? So you, you have to make sure that it's, it's right, right the first time. On arrival, the bridge parts, weighing in at more than 400 tons, are carefully removed from the trucks. The sky bridge is reassembled into five sections, comprising the two 40-meter long legs, the two ends of the bridge, and its midsection. In no time, the lifting operation commences. The process begins with the lifting of the bridge's legs that each weigh 60 tons. Powerful hydraulic jacks help to ease a complex and dangerous operation. Each leg is slowly maneuvered into a vertical position over their permanent bearings at level 29 and secured. With this part of the process completed, lifting crews turn their attention to the bigger challenge of the operation. Lifting the 325 ton bridge midsection. This will not be an easy climb. The lifting operation begins. The midsection makes the ascent slowly at 12 meters an hour. 
engineers carefully observe each second of the process. In an operation that will take more than 30 hours to execute, anything can happen. Sure enough, it does. A tropical storm suddenly erupts over Kuala Lumpur. But there was no way the engineers could stop the bridge midway through its ascent. So the lifting continues. As the lifting draws closer to the end, everyone thinks they got the better of Mother Nature. Until the lifting mechanism of the bridge section stops without warning. What happened was the computers that was used to lift up the sky bridge got struck by lightning and the whole process actually stops and uh, they had to actually repair it almost overnight. We can't leave the midsection dangling there not knowing what's going to happen next. So I think everybody was actually praying. That was the most uh, the sleepless nights. I, I, I used to sleep most of the time, but that was one time that I didn't sleep at night. <laughs> To everyone's relief, the problem is quickly resolved, and the bridge continues its ascent to reach its intended height. After almost three days of painstaking lifting work, the bridge finally gets bolted into place, with its legs resting firmly on both towers. The goal of building the highest sky bridge in the world has finally been realized. With the sky bridge now in place, engineers turn their attention to another defining feature of the towers, the pinnacles. It's hard to believe that these elegant structures, so comfortably perched on the top of the tallest twin towers in the world, were never in the original plan of the buildings. In the original submission by Pelly, the roof or the top of the building was a flat roof. So it, it seemed abrupt. To the owners, it seemed an abrupt ending or rather an abrupt crown to the building. Uh, it seems incomplete. So Mr. Pelly was asked to come back with several options. It was a very difficult element to design. We had more alternatives for the pinnacles than for any other element of the tower. It was just how to capture the right quality the right flavor for the pinnacles. The design solution came, once again, from the earlier connection Pelly made with Islamic art and culture to create the look of the Petronas Towers. This time, he looked closely at the curved beauty of the domes on mosques all over the city and decided to adapt their design for the tower's pinnacles. It's a very subtle intellectual relationship, but Somehow it is felt, and people feel it, connect with it, and can sense that this is a form that connects with their culture, connects with Islam, connects with Malaysia. Convinced by the reasoning behind this design, Pelly pitched the idea to the building's owners. Everyone is sold on the idea, but it was more than just the unique design that appealed to them. With the pinnacle, it essentially pushed this building to become the tallest building then. It would have gone up 452 meters, making it slightly taller than then tallest building in the world, which was Sears Tower. So, you know, it's almost by accident, but it was created because of a need statement, which said that there was something incomplete in the design. Without the pinnacles, the Petronas Towers would rise to 379 meters. Adding the pinnacles meant an additional 73 meters in height. It's like adding another 20 stories to the towers. After Pelly's design was approved, the prefabricated parts of the pinnacles arrived from Japan. Each 176 ton pinnacle is split into different segments and transported carefully to the building site. Erecting the steel mast of the pinnacle was a master stroke during an installation that took three full days. Engineers lifted the parts to the 83rd floor and with the help of a hydro jacking system, raised each segment of the mast bit by bit to an opening in the roof. 
and we did it like a Lego set. You know, you put the pinnacle there, and then the next bit, and the next bit, and the next bit, and then we hydraulically jacked it up. I mean, that was my favorite part, you know, of getting it to that and becoming the tallest. And we did that about 3 a.m. in the morning. Though the method of constructing the pinnacles was hidden from view, the results can now be seen in their full glory for miles around. For designer Cesar Belli, raising the pinnacles represented not just the inventiveness of engineering, but is also symbolic of the aspiration of mankind. They carry your eye to the top, and it allows you for your eye to continue to the sky, to heaven. It took more than eight years of planning and construction, but today the Petronas Towers are one of the most sought-after international business addresses in the world. They have become the national icon of Malaysia, and have established a true sense of a city center for Kuala Lumpur that did not previously exist. But this national icon is far from an idle monument. As the thriving hub of the city center, the Petronas Towers have over 10,000 occupants from all over the world, demanding the highest standards of safety and comfort. From day one, Abdul Hadi has been the man overseeing the building operations of the towers. The biggest challenge here is the uh, safety of our 10,000 people within this building. It's any new buildings uh, with the new equipment, new installation, you don't know exactly how the system is going to behave. You have to run it to make sure that they work as per design. To keep the towers operating at the highest international standards, the combined efforts of humans and machines are needed to make it run like clockwork. And doing this properly requires working round the clock. Even though the exterior cleaning operations run every day, it still takes the team almost six months just to complete one cleaning cycle. But it takes less than 60 seconds in the tower's unique high-speed lifts to get people safely up and down over 80 stories. It's a one-of-a-kind double-decker lift system that requires the biggest lift machine rooms in the world. But to truly be an icon, sometimes feats of engineering are not enough. If the super lifts are its heartbeat, then the 2,600 square meter, 850 seat concert hall represents the soul of the building. My favorite part of this building is the concert hall. Why? To have a concert hall in an office building uh, created immediately a recognition of the human needs. The developers recognized the need for life around the towers early on. Finishing touches like a 40-acre public park would forever ensure the tower's special place in the city. The building itself is special, but the additions, uh, which were not tangibly really part of the towers, but created the space, uh, I think, uh, made it extra special. What the Petronas Towers have done is they have brought the sense of symbolism, the sense of romance that a skyscraper can have. I think they have become classic skyscrapers in a par with the Chrysler Building or the Empire State Building. And as such, they have captured the imagination of people all over the world. This building is in Kuala Lumpur. It has to reflect the heritage of this country. It had to reflect the cultures. And, but very importantly, we said we wanted this building to look beautiful, to show progress. Alida Arif was one of the key administrators in charge of planning the towers. And like many of her colleagues at the time, she saw the symbolic value in a skyscraper. 
it was very important of us for the symbolic reasons to show progress, to show aspirations of the country, that's aspirations for Malaysia to become an industrialized country. The design of the tower, in particular because of its heights, is sort of reaching for the sky image, seems to, to depict that aspiration. The Betranas Towers were supposed to stand out as an ultra-modern icon, but they still had to retain their Malaysian identity and incorporate many of the nation's most identifiable cultural motifs in and religions. 25 million Malays, Indians, Chinese and other ethnicities live side by side in a predominantly Islamic society. Economic development between the 1980s and 90s has also put the country on the fast track to becoming one of Southeast Asia's tiger economies. One major beneficiary of this prosperous time is Malaysia's capital city, Kuala Lumpur, the heart of the country's industry and commerce. During this period, the physical landscape of the city transformed. Numerous construction projects emerged, making Kuala Lumpur one of the most built-up capitals in the region. One of my abiding memories of Kuala Lumpur in the 1990s was just the number of cranes on the skyline. I've never seen a, a city, I think, uh, with so much construction going on. But despite the construction boom, the cityscape still didn't have a focal point, a single identifiable land. Kuala Lumpur, capital of Malaysia, home to the world's tallest twin skyscrapers, the Petronas Towers. Supported by the world's deepest foundation. Spanned by the world's highest sky bridge. Over a billion dollars worth of concrete, steel and glass went into their epic construction that took almost eight years. The Petronas Towers are not only marvels of engineering, they're uniquely Malaysian icons for the 21st century. is a bustling melting pot of races mark that the world would come to know. Cities, city authorities, politicians everywhere are seeking to put their cities, put their nations on world maps. But it seems to me that perhaps there was a recognition in the 1990s that, that many people around the world didn't have a, a clear sense of, of where Malaysia was. The Malaysian government sought to rectify this and let the world know they were a true global player. They needed to build a first world icon grand enough to announce their arrival on the world stage. Taking cues from iconic skyscrapers in the west, the Malaysians decided they would also build a one-of-a-kind skyscraper, or in this case, two-of-a-kind. They named them the Petronas Towers. The firms were all told that this would be the headquarters of the national oil company, Petronas. To their design. With this brief in mind, a competition was launched worldwide for top architectural firms to submit design ideas. The winning entry eventually comes from Cesar Pelli, the world-renowned Argentinian architect. I thought that the request that we connect the building with Malaysia was a very good request. And we explore quite thoroughly Malaysian traditions, Malaysian buildings, Malaysian craft to capture the essence of what Malaysian means in a building. Pelly took his inspiration from what he saw all around Kuala Lumpur. He reinterpreted the symmetrical patterns of classic Islamic architecture and integrated them into the design of the ultra-modern Twin Towers. As a result, bridging the gap between technology